Now for an introduction to our speaker. I first met Professor Fraley nearly 20 years ago on a university campus in Beijing. We were both students in a Chinese language summer immersion program. We pledged to use only Chinese that summer. And that meant that we used only our Chinese names. So I did not know him as Matthew, but instead as Ma Xiaofan. Uh, Ma Xiaofan and I had both studied Japanese and lived in Japan. And we were both in our first years in our respective PhD programs. Been friends with him ever since. Um, I was too daunted by the sheer difficulty of Chinese to continue my studies there further, but Professor Fraley went on and on and on. He returned to Beijing the following summer. He later studied Chinese abroad in Taiwan, and he kept studying uh, literature in Chinese even in Japan. I think it's now safe to say that he is the leading scholar within the Anglophone world of poetry written by people from Japan but in the Chinese language or as he calls it, literary sinitic. He now routinely contributes authoritative entries to such reference works as the Cambridge History of Japanese Literature and the Oxford Handbook of Modern Chinese Literatures. He's also published two books and a plethora of articles in peer-reviewed journals. In my eyes, though, what distinguishes Professor Fraley's scholarship is that so much of it has been built on the kinds of activity that are deeply out of fashion these days, kinds of uh, scholarly activity that may, be, may not be explicitly discouraged, but which are only rarely recognized. I refer here first to his extensive published output in Japanese. Uh, based on the CV which he provided us, I've counted at least eight article-length publications. He did not have these translated into Japanese, but he actually composed them in Japanese on his own. These in two, include two articles from Kokugo Kokubun, a venerable journal published at Kyoto University since 1926. In the United States, tenure and promotion committees, in the humanities at least, tend to be unimpressed by any publication that is not in English. In spite of this disincentive, Professor Fraley has successfully defied the pressure to write in only one language. He plainly cares that his scholarship not just explain literature in Japan, but also that it be accessible to and in dialogue with scholars who primarily use Japanese. Still more impressive to me is the place in the place is the place in Professor Fraley's publication record of so many long and copiously annotated translations. These are translations not just from recent publications in Japanese, but much more often from what is often in extremely difficult Sinitic writing, dense with allusion and intertextual reference. His first book, New Chronicles of Yanagi Bashi and a Diary of a Journey to the West, Narushima Ryuhoku Reports from Home and Abroad, deserved the Japan-US Friendship Prize that it earned, um, not only for its 300 plus pages of painstaking translation, but also in my book for the fact that Professor Fraley had to produce his own page proofs which meant that he essentially not only wrote the book, but set the type for it himself. Um, however inexplicably, the humanities in our day reward the production as what I think is only generously called theory. However this theory be construed, it is far too often untethered to any specific historical process or even to any specific text. Again, defying the passing fads of the, the academy, uh, Professor Fraley has shown extraordinary curiosity and intellectual humility in learning about somebody else's theory, that is, the vast, vast body of Sinitic literature and learning that was as much the patrimony of Japan as of its continental neighbors. As one of Professor Fraley's um, book endorsers says, just as the topic of his recent book, uh, Plucking Chrysanthemums, Narushima Ryuhoku, and Sinitic Literary Traditions in, Japanese, in Modern Japan, just as uh, the subject of this book was one of the preeminent writers of his era in the realm of Sinitic Japanese literature, so too has his biographer become a leader among the growing number of scholars working to revive this once vibrant literary space. Um, I give you Professor Matthew Fraley. Thank you, uh, Micah, for that uh, very kind uh, introduction. Um, it's, uh, I, I appreciate very much the invitation to uh, come speak here uh, today. Uh, f 
Professor Arbach's uh, mention of the sort of unfashionable nature of uh, the research that I do um, uh, r reminded me of experiences that I've had uh, up until uh, quite recently where I would uh, be asked what I work on and I would explain I work on uh, classical Chinese uh, literature as written uh, by Japanese uh, people and very often the response was why on earth would you study that? Uh, why don't you study Japanese literature or Chinese literature, but not this kind of uh, chuto hampa uh, thing in the middle? And uh, so that was my experience for uh, all of graduate school and uh, initial job market and so forth. But uh, last year I was um, uh, ha I'm introduced to a Japanese scholar. I said what I did, um, and he said, "Sore wa ima ichiban shun janai desu ka." Meaning that's that's what's really hot these days. So <laughs> at, at, at long last, I guess. Um, but uh, I'd like to also thank everyone um, at the uh, Center for Japanese Studies. It's been uh, the reception's been very, uh, very uh, welcoming. Um, so, visible rhymes, uh, inaudible echoes. My somewhat synesthetic title uh, may sound odd at first glance. After all, rhyme is a feature of a poem or other literary text that we typically imagine should manifest itself audibly. Likewise, echoes that intertextually bind one poem to another, and here I have in mind the repetition of specific diction, syntax, structure, and other formal features should be apparent, it would seem, when the text is vocalized. Today I'll be discussing poetic texts where such rhymes and echoes are unquestionably present, indeed central to the text's very composition and reception, and yet these rhymes and echoes are not necessarily realized vocally, or at least not realized in dominant performative modes of vocalization. The texts that uh, I will examine are Sinitic poems composed in 19th century Japan, works that are now called kanshi. This term, kanshi, is, is now ubiquitous in both academic and popular usage in Japan as well as abroad. But I should note at the outset that I am using this term under duress, merely for expedience. So when I use the word kanshi today, you will have to imagine that it has an asterisk beside it or appears in scare quotes. For one thing, the term kanshi is misleading, indicating different bodies of poetry in Japanese and Anglophone scholarship. When Anglophone scholars write of kanshi, they often mean Chinese poems by Japanese composers specifically. But in Japanese usage, kanshi in fact refers to literary Sinitic poetry as a whole, regardless of authorial nationality. So in Japanese usage of the term, both famous Chinese poets like Du Fu or Li Bo, as well as famous Japanese poets like Sugo Aru no Michizane and Ishikawa Jozan were all authors of kanshi. And what's more, beyond this gap between present-day Anglophone and Japanese usage, the term kanshi is also anachronistic, since none of the poets I discuss today would have used the term kanshi to describe what they wrote. To these 19th century Japanese, the Sinitic poems that they labored to create were simply shi, the same term by which they were known to other members of the Sinosphere. In fact, when the term kanshi uh, first emerged in the 1880s to 1890s, some objected strenuously. Uh, this man, Noguchi Neisai, uh, in his um, uh, remarks on poetry for young men, uh, said, I beseech the youths not to crown shi with the useless wart kan. Uh, so with apologies to Noguchi Neisai, today, as I said, I will use, I will, I will use this wart uh, the useless word of kan uh, to refer to kanshi occasionally. But <coughs> regardless of which Japanese term uh, we use, the point is the same. Uh, either way, neither the Japanese term shi nor the term that replaced it, kanshi, makes a distinction among Sinitic verses composed by Japanese, Chinese, Koreans, Vietnamese, and others. Indeed, one of the main points I would like to make today lies in this terminological equivalence that Japanese composers of Sinitic verse saw themselves as taking part in an enterprise that they shared with their counterparts in China and elsewhere. To be sure, there are important variations in how Sinitic verse was enjoyed and performed throughout East Asia, but this basic identity is absolutely fundamental to understanding the practice. As these terminological issues begin to suggest, there is a tension between the widespread prevalence of classical Sinitic literature, a corpus of text that was central to the literary expression of an entire region, and the restrictive boundaries of modern nation states. 
Similarly, the large body of Sinaitic works written by Japanese has proven difficult to accommodate under disciplinary rubrics that are premised upon phonocentric assumptions about the monolingualism of a given text and the unitary linguistic coherence of a national literary canon. While there has been a great deal of interest in such writings in recent years, even among specialists, the jury is still very much out on some rather basic matters. Here's one. This is a text uh, from late uh, Tokugawa period, Japan. It was published uh, in the Meiji period. Um, and it has, uh, there are two copies worldwide. One is uh, owned by the National Diet Library of Japan, and the other is owned by the University of California, Berkeley. Now, if you, the, the author is the same, the title is the same, the imprint is the same, but you'll notice one difference. One of these texts, uh, uh, one of the libraries, has regarded the same text, if you look at number one, as a Japanese text. The second library has regarded uh, the same text, they're looking at the same text, as a Chinese text. So how can this be, right? This is something that's not true, it's true not simply um, because there's some sort of difference of understanding between America and, uh, and Japan, for example. If you look at this uh, text, uh, another one, Shishihin, this is uh, Ichino Meian's, um, the University of Tokyo classifies it as Chinese. Uh, a different library um, in uh, Japan classifies it as Japanese. Same text. So are these texts in Chinese or are they in Japanese? As I think you'll uh, understand at the end of uh, today's talk, I think the answer is obvious, uh, yes. Um, <laughs> but um, I think it's, it's worth reflecting on uh, reasons why this uh, ambiguity exists. For a long time, the few Anglophone scholars to take up Japanese kanji simply called it Chinese poetry. But recently, various scholars have proposed other terms. And there are good arguments to be made for all of these terms. Uh, each attempts to capture the same literary phenomenon, but highlights a different aspect. So um, Tim Wickstead has argued for uh, Sino-Japanese. Uh, David Lurie um, emphasizing the vernacular uh, way that these texts are performed. Uh, he highlights that he uses Chinese style. Uh, Vipka Denica used Sino-Japanese. Um, I think lately she's, she's moving in a different direction. Um, uh, I use Sinitic. Uh, and so forth. And they're, they're, we're all looking at the same phenomenon, but we're highlighting different aspects of it. Um, so one reason for this ambiguity is that the pronunciation of individual characters, as well as the reading strategies and methods employed in the recitation of literary Sinitic texts, have varied widely, historically and geographically, both within China and throughout the Sinosphere. So a single written text, such as this line from the Analects, could thus be vocalized in multiple ways. We might divide these various vocalization strategies into two major categories. The first is those on the bottom half of the diagram, phonetic or straight down reading approaches, uh, ondoku, bodoku, boyomi in Japanese, and these merely enunciate the local language's imitation of the Chinese pronunciation of each character, that is, each character's Sinozenic reading. At the top half of the diagram is the second category called kundoku in Japanese. And, this, and in this approach, uh, the text is rearranged and read through the local vernacular. This has been historically a very important means of Japanese engagement with literary Sinitic texts, called kanbun kundoku, uh, reading literary Sinitic with a vernacular gloss. In this method of vernacular reading, the literary Sinitic text is transformed into a distinct uh, and usually highly Sinified register of Japanese. Uh, a sort of translationese that preserves as closely as possible the diction and structure of the written text while construing it in accord with Japanese syntax and with the necessary grammatical particles and inflections. <coughs> while both ondoku and kundoku style approaches to reading literary Sinitic yield vocalizations, we should also note a fundamental difference between them. Kundoku inescapably entails an interpretive act, analyzing the original text, positing how its pieces fit together grammatically, and thus concluding what it says. But with rare exceptions, so, uh, no such interpretation is necessary for ondoku. This is one reason why there are many valid kundoku readings for a given Sinitic text. You can see across the top, the same line as there are three, three different ways it's been read. <coughs> that is, um, I might add that the style for Korean, which you see here, I've classified it as ondoku because it's basically ondoku. Um, however, if you note this, um, the uh, myung here or the a at the end, uh, indicating um, uh, conditional or an exclamatory. Um, there's a little bit of uh, vernacular insertion here, so I've sort of elevated it uh, uh, closer, closer to the kundoku side, but basically ondoku. Um, so uh, 
this phenomenon of vernacular reading, as we can see, uh, was not unique to Japan. Uh, for early on in their course of their encounters with Chinese texts, many cultures on the periphery of Chinese civilization developed a host of approaches for making literary Sinitic texts intelligible in their local languages. Recent research has, in fact, pointed to similarities between East Asian vernacular reading practices and those developed within the European context. Far from an exception, John Whitman argues that vernacular reading, that is, reading a text written in the script, orthography, lexicon, and grammar of a more prestigious cosmopolitan language out loud in the vernacular language, has been a standard and widespread process throughout the history of written languages. In the Japanese case, the pioneers of writing in the archipelago, very likely influenced by practices conveyed by scribes with ties to the Korean peninsula, developed over the centuries the apparatus of kundoku as a means to render literary Sinitic texts more accessible to speakers of uh, Japanese. Systems of gloss marks called kumten were developed to annotate literary Sinitic texts and thereby indicate how they might be read through kundoku. <coughs> so this is the same passage from the Analects taken from a Japanese edition with kumten that was influential in the Edo period. The original text as well as Huyen's commentary are both reprinted intact, allowing us to read the text directly. But if we wished to, construct, uh, to construe the text in Japanese, we could follow the tiny kunten marks to the right and the left of the Chinese graphs uh, that comprise the main texts. The marks to the right help, to, uh, uh, help the reader by identifying uh, and adding grammatical markers, guiding pronunciation and identifying the conjugation of verbs. The marks to the left indicate syntactical changes, helping the reader to identify how to shift the order of words in a sentence in order to read it according with uh, Japanese grammar. So your own monitors may be easier to read uh, than this. I don't know if you can see the little marks here. But uh, this little check mark, the left side indicating the syntactical changes. So the first one is a little check, uh, and that means flip these two. So don't read this first, read this one first. So you read this, tomo, go back, ari. Then you hit this one, and there's a little two here, and that means don't read this now. Uh, and so you skip that, uh, and then you hit empo, and then you hit a one here, and that means, oh, you remember that two back there? Go back and read that. So empo yori kitaru. And then two, okay, so skip that, right? Mata uh, tanoshika da zu ya. So this uh, is an example. It's actually um, a very straightforward example, easy example uh, from Kunten practice. In full flower, it, uh, the Kunten system gets uh, even more Baroque and, uh, and so on, but I think you can understand the, uh, the principles here. Um, so widespread was this reading method that a highly trained Japanese reader of literary Sinitic might not require gloss marks at all in order to make an on-the-fly construal of the text in Japanese by means of kundoku. The crucial point is that whether or not the Japanese reader made use of written annotations, the original Sinitic text remained intact and in view. I said a moment ago that the product of reading a text through Kambun Kundoku was a kind of translationese. And indeed, we can understand Kambun Kundoku as an act that combines reading, interpretation, and translation. When we read a work in translation, we often wonder what is missing. A sense of inevitable loss here uh, articulated uh, by Don Quixote. But the most significant fact about Kambun Kundoku is that the source text never disappears. If, if Don Quixote compared reading a translation to looking at Flemish tapestries from the wrong side, then Kambun Kundoku is a method that performs its work on the tapestry's right side, often through annotations visibly inscribed upon the source text. Though Kundoku differs in some important ways from the processes we typically associate with the term translation, Inasmuch as it operates at the interface of two languages, it is useful to think of kundoku as a form of translation where the target text does not replace the source text, but merely supplements it. Indeed, the target text, that is the oral pronunciation, may never be written down. In this sense, the production of this target text depends heavily on the involvement of the reader, who must be at least somewhat familiar with both source and target language. I've taken the time to explain Kambun Kundoku because it is an important aspect of Japanese engagements with literary Sinitic. Consideration of how it works can give us insight into how a text might have sounded when read out loud, but what I hope to show in my presentation today is that literary Sinitic poems must be understood most fundamentally as written discourse. Uh, 
Whereas some scholars see the apparently literary Sinitic script merely as a regional graphic standard, a conventional way of encoding a given Japanese sentence uh, that exists anterior to inscription, I argue that such an approach is incomplete and misleading when applied to Sinitic verse composed by Japanese poets. The possibility of transforming any literary Sinitic text into a form of Japanese by means of kundoku creates an ambiguity in the minds of some as to whether texts written in literary Sinitic by Japanese should properly be considered literary Sinitic at all. Today I will argue that kundoku and other forms of vocalization can best be understood as varieties of performance. The written poetic text is neither interchangeable with nor reducible to a single rendition produced by any particular mode. While it is important to consider the range of performative possibilities latent in or implied by the poetic text, we should always bear in mind the fact that the vocalization is an extra textual or at least paratextual feature and that undue focus upon it can blind us to more significant features of the poem as a written text. In the wake of the phonocentrism that has pervaded modern Japanese literary study, the status of literary Sinitic texts as written texts can easily escape our attention. But I hope my discussion of several poetic works from 19th century Japan will convince you of the importance of considering written texts as such. Before diving into these poems, however, let me offer a final analogy that I hope will further clarify the nature of kundoku. This is a primer from the 1870s, showing one way in which Japanese scholars applied the kundoku methodology to the study of Western languages such as Dutch and English. So you can see here, uh, it is my cat, my cat on a mat, is the cat fat? Yes, the cat is fat. Can the cat run? Yes, but it cannot run so far as a fox. <coughs> If you look here, um, above each of these English words is written um, an imitation of the English pronunciation. Uh, so above it is my cat, we have ito isu mai kato. Uh, and then my cat on a mat, mai kato on a matto, right? Um, and then beneath, there's a one to one uh, uh, translation, gloss of each of these terms, uh, so, and an ordinal. Um, character that indicates, uh, a numeral that indicates uh, how these uh, pieces can be rearranged. So we could follow this and read, uh, Sore wa ware no neko de aru. Shikimono no ue no ware no neko. Neko wa koete aru ka? <coughs> so my cat on a mat is the cat fat may not seem a rewarding target of literary analysis. <laughs> um, but I think it is fair to say that two features of it as English that are, are obvious um, are its rhyme and its rhythm. Even one who's not fluent in spoken English, who recites the text uh, in the manner of Japanese ondoku, as moai kato ane matto, ische kato fatto, can perceive these features. To insist, however, on viewing the script merely as an elaborate means to deliver a Japanese meaning, shikimono no ue no ware no neko, neko wa koete aru ka? renders invisible features of the text that obviously guided its composition and offers little insight in return. If cat and mat are conceived of as just packages for the Japanese words neko and shikimono no, what principle accounts for the Japanese word that follows them as sentence terminus being koete, that is, fat? In much the same way, the Japanese readers uh, and writers of literary Sinitic poetic texts were free to choose from various possible vocalizations that might be situated on a gradient from Japanese to Chinese orientation, but they clearly also attended closely to textual features evident only in the written Chinese form, including its rhyme and rhythm. In 1868, rule by the Tokugawa shoguns came to an end in Japan and a new government centered on the emperor was established. The emperor relocated from the western capital, Kyoto, to the eastern city of Edo, which was renamed Tokyo, or Toke, uh, meaning the eastern capital. One of the first literary works to be published in this new Meiji era, and also one of the first to get its authors into trouble with the authorities, uh, was Tokeishi, Poems on Tokyo by Onuma Chinzan. He was arguably the eastern capital's preeminent kanji poet at the time. Printed in 1869, Tokeishi features 30 of Chinzan's Sinetic poems depicting the new mores, manners, and material culture of the Meiji era. These 30 poems were brushed in sets of three by uh, 10 of the leading calligraphers of the time, 
And these calligraph texts were accompanied by topical illustrations provided by various artists and the whole work bound together to produce uh, a handsome Leporello volume. So this page, um, for example, contains the collection's first three poems uh, inscribed by the Edo-based uh, calligrapher Kulsai Tanzan, who among other things was British diplomat Ernest Sato's calligraphy instructor. Uh, so this is the first quatrain um, and it reads, uh, the Son of Heaven has moved the capital, bestowing his favor. The young girls of Tokyo are as beautiful as flowers. Now we see that the Duck River has lost out to the Gull Ferry. In their state garments, how many officials think nothing of their houses? As you can see from the date and the signature at the left, Tanzan completed the brushwork for Qinzan's three quatrains on the first anniversary of the formal transfer of the capital. Humorous regional rivalries were a mainstay of early modern print culture, and in this first poem, Qinzan reveals an Edo dweller's pride in the victory of the new eastern capital over its western counterpart. Qinzan metonymically invokes the two capitals by means of the principal rivers that dominate their topographies the toponym Duck River referring to Kyoto's Kamogawa and Gull Ferry referring to the Sumidagawa. With the latter term, Gull Ferry, uh, Chinzan alludes to perhaps the best known image of the Eastern hinterlands from the vantage point of Heian era high culture. In the Azuma Kudari or Descent to the East sequence of the 9th century Ise Monogatari, the East appears as the remote and unrefined destination of an anonymous man. In the ninth section of the tale, the exiled man, conventionally identified as Ariwara no Narihira, uh, inquires of a Sumidagawa ferryman as to the name of the white gulls he sees upon the river's waters. When the ferryman answers that they are called Miyakodori, or capital birds, the exiled Narihira figure is prompted to homesick thoughts of the western capital he was compelled to leave behind, composing an apostrophic address to the gulls inquiring after his beloved. The iconic scene has been the subject of numerous visual representations over the centuries, such as the woodcut you see here uh, from an early modern edition of the text, or this painting from the 17th century. Indeed, the yuri kamome, or black-headed gull, that these earlier, uh, the early Heian courtiers apparently encountered is now the official metropolitan bird, tocho, of Tokyo. Uh, and the Yuri Kamome has also lent its name to the sleek, if somewhat pricey, elevated train that whisks passengers off to Odaiba and other destinations around the area where the Sumida empties into Tokyo Bay. Given the long-standing status of the Sumida River as a celebrated topos of the eastern region in general, uh, and more specifically as the definitive marker of the site that would eventually become the city of Tokyo, it is no surprise that this, the first illustration in Shinzan's Poems of Tokyo, depicts the Sumida, complete with, as you can see uh, at left, the characteristic gulls. By using the elusively freighted term gull ferry in his poem, Qinzan momentarily conjures the codified associations of longing for the Western capital and despondence over separation from it that had been established in the Issei account of Narihira's visit there. Yet no sooner have these implications emerged than they are dispelled by the third line's triumphant proclamation of the Eastern capital's ascendancy. Moreover, the river metonyms have an especial piquancy in that they call to mind images of each city's thriving nightlife, an association that Qinzan exploits in the poem's devastating final line when he mocks the Western transplants who accompanied the emperor as aristocratic Aravists rushing to patronize the Eastern capital's pleasure districts. The second group of three poems in the collection is accompanied by this illustration depicting another type of Western transplant new to Tokyo streets. It shows two Europeans or Americans outside the Ryugasakiro brothel in the new Shimabara licensed quarter of the Tsukiji foreign concession. The two foreign men shown here engage in carefree conversation while a finely dressed young woman, presumably a, a Kamuro, a courtesan's uh, attendant, approaches them solicitously. The jarring novelty of the spectacle is heightened by the obvious curiosity of the Japanese man in traditional dress who walks through the illustration's foreground. The poem by Chinzan that gave rise to this illustration reads as follows. A little young Joe is this new Shimabara. Uh, 
Our land's warriors act as guards protecting the barbarian ships. Hey, mister, she urges, no need to carry your two iron swords. You just need to bring 100,000 in cash. <laughs> like the woodcut it inspired, Chinzan's poem highlights a new range of social and gender relations that followed on the heels of the Restoration, focusing in particular on the issue of Japanese men's status. The poem imagining Tokyo's new Shimabara as a, a little Yangzhou, Yangzhou being a city on the banks of the Yangtze River that's celebrated uh, for its bustling nightlife since the days of uh, Dumu, uh, appears in the second set of three at the far left. In case I have not been clear, the calligraphy that you see here is the text itself. There is no Japanese rendition of the text to which these calligraphed Sinitic poems are a mere ornamental accompaniment. This is all there is. These poems are presented as what they are, Sinitic poems, and that is how readers encountered them. Let us return to the collection's opening poems, the first of which I read out loud before. If we pose the question, how did Chinzan vocalize this poem? The answer is not entirely clear, especially since there are no kunten marks in the original. But in all likelihood, since Chinzan did not speak Chinese, he almost certainly did not vocalize it as I did a few minutes ago using modern Mandarin pronunciation. So how might this be read? Well, let's look at the first couplet. In a 1943 book, Kinoshita Hyo uses Kanbun Kundoku to render the couplet as follows. Tenshi sen to chouka o shiku, tokei no jijo bi hana no kotoshi. This is an utterly sensible reading, but Kundoku is fundamentally an interpretive act, a performance by which the reader makes a series of judgments, translating the Sinitic text into a form of Japanese. Scholars such as Suzuki Naoji and Saito Fumitoshi who have traced the history of kundoku have shown that the act is anything but mechanical. The ways in which a given literary Sinitic text is read according to kundoku have evolved radically over time. In broad terms, they have shifted from earlier approaches that produced a vocalization richer in indigenous Japanese terms to approaches that make more use of Sinitic terms. If we recall that kundoku is essentially a kind of translation, these, then terms from translation theory can be helpful here. Generally speaking, the performative act that is kundoku has shifted from a target language focused approach to one that is source language focused. In addition to such long-term historical trends in the evolution of kundoku practice, even when we consider kundoku as practiced within a single time period, it remains subject to a range of aesthetic concerns, academic allegiances, and even personal predilections. The inherently uh, idiosyncratic nature of kundoku is evident when we look at how other scholars following Kinoshita Hyo have rendered this couplet of Chinzan's. In Sato Yojin's uh, 1981 version, we have instead Tenshi sen to chouka o shiku tokei no jijo bi narukoto hana no gotoshi. Sato had certainly seen uh, Kinoshita's rendition when he made his own, but thought he could improve upon it by expanding bi to bi narukoto. A decade later, uh, Hinotatsuo, who had certainly seen Kinoshita's version, if not Sato's too, offered yet another performance. Tenshi Miyako Tsushite Chouka o Shiku Tokei no Jijo bi Narukoto Hana no Gotoshi. So, as these three different readings by three eminent experts on Kanshibun show, the vocalization of literary Sinitic is not something intrinsic to the text itself. These are three logical readings, but we could easily think of other possibilities. Tenshi miyako tsushitareba chouka o shikeri tokei no jijo utsukushiki koto hana no gotoshi. While there are some very slight and subtle differences in the precise implications of these various readings, I would be the first to say that the differences between them are not ultimately so significant. That's precisely the point of the approaches we could adopt to this text. Trying to generate a single definitive Japanese gloss is perhaps not the most productive. There is simply not a cor single correct answer to the question of how this couplet ought to be properly vocalized. This is true even for solidly canonized uh, works. So this is a couplet by Sugawara no Michizane. Um, since leaving home uh, three or four months, I shed tears a, a hundred or a thousand lines. Um, one preeminent Japanese scholar of early Heian texts, uh, presumably attempting to reconstruct a highly uh, Japanized uh, rendition that would be more in line with the target-oriented approach to kundoku that prevailed in Michizane's time, he renders the lines, as you see at, uh, at, at the first example there, ie uh, o hanarete mitsuki yotsuki otsuru namuda wa momotsura chitsura. Uh, 
But uh, another equally illustrious Japanese scholar instead suggests a sparer, syntactically unrearranged, all Sinitic Sinozenic reading, Rika san shigatsu, rakurui, hyakusenko. In some cases, manuscripts contain gloss marks that can help us work out a plausible vocalization in line with what we uh, have been able to reconstruct about contemporary kundoku styles, but a great many Sinitic texts by Japanese circulated with no gloss marks whatsoever, such as we saw uh, with Chinzan's series on Tokyo. Even if some gloss marks are present in a text, it is not always clear who added them and when, and they almost never record a full phonetic transcription, all of which means that a conjecture about vocalization can only ever be one possible rendition among many. The first two scholars' readings of Michizane's couplet could hardly be more dissimilar from one another, and other scholars have proposed any number of additional possibilities. While these various reconstructions are definitely worthwhile contributions to our historical understanding of how a text might have been orally recited in a particular context, we must not delude ourselves into thinking that if we could only pinpoint the correct kundoku gloss, we would there, thereby have fully grasped what the Japanese Sinitic poet was really trying to write. Even if we could reliably reconstruct how a Japanese author of a given Sinitic text vocalized it, this would only be part of the picture. Such knowledge would shed important light on the text's performance, but would also shift our attention away from features of the written text that were unmistakably central to its composition. I would argue that rather than imagining the existence of an irrecoverable Japanese sentence that exists anterior to the literary Sinitic, it is more meaningful for us to focus on the one thing that we actually do have before us, the literary Sinitic text. For Michizane, Chinzan, and all other Japanese composers of proper kanshi, the poems they endeavored to create had to function as literary Sinitic texts. That was the sine qua non of their enterprise. This is first of all apparent in their poems' uh, formal adherence to several normative standards of Chinese versification, beginning with rhyme. These regularly spaced highlighted graphs indicate that these three poems uh, visible, uh, th that they have a visible rhyme scheme with rhyme characters uh, occupying the terminal lines of each quatrain's first, second, and fourth lines. So, Hua Hua Jia, Gong Tong Zhong, etc. These codified rhymes were based upon Middle Chinese pronunciation, but rhyme manuals were widely available to both 19th century Japanese poets and their Chinese counterparts. These rhymes are visible at the terminus of each line, but when the text is vocalized through the kundoku process, the rhymes often become inaudible. Recall that each of the three oral performances proposed by the three scholars I discussed earlier would read the first couplet in a way, uh, in such a way as to end with chokao shiku, and the second with something like bi or bi naru koto hana no gotoshi, uh, either of which obscures uh, the rhyme. In addition to uh, end rhyme, Japanese kanji poets, like their contemporaries elsewhere in the Sinosphere, also paid attention to tonal features within each line. Again, these are based on Middle Chinese. Specifically, they endeavored to follow certain established patterns of alternation between level and deflected tones when they composed uh, jin ti shi, or poems in the modern style, that is from, from the 7th or 8th century. Um, so you can see here the pattern of level tones represented by an empty circle and deflected tones represented by a filled in circle in Qinzan's poet. Uh, Qinzan's poem. Um, I'll avoid getting too deep in the weeds here, but uh, if you look at the second character, um, there's a rule that says that the second character and the fourth character should be opposite values here. Two and four should be opposite, and two and six are the same. But within a couplet, two, th you, you switch for these uh, positions. So you have opposite here, opposite here, and you have opposite here. And then between two couplets, same. So this is the same, this is the same, this is the same, uh, et cetera. There are other rules, but um, uh, suffice to say that uh, Qinzan's poem um, uh, fulfills all of these uh, requirements. So if anyone doubts that Qinzan's Tokyo poems functions as Sinetic poetry, consider this recent book on modern Japanese kanbungaku or Sinetic literature written by uh, uh, Gao Wen Han, a Chinese scholar, uh, published in the mainland and targeting an audience not particularly familiar with, Jap with Japan, nor needless to say with the Japanese language. Uh, it devotes a few pages to Qinzan's career and includes several of his poems on Tokyo. So how does Gao introduce Qinzan's poems to his mainland audience? Well, he just quotes the poem that we've been looking at. No further explanation is required beyond some historical context about the transfer of the capital to Tokyo. There is uh, one other point that's worth mentioning, however. As Gao notes, 
Shinzan's 30 poems on Tokyo, since they concern emergent social realities and new customs, make some use of Japanese local terms. For example, this first poem contains the toponyms Gull Ferry and Duck River. The poem about the brothel had new Shimabara, and another poem in the collection uses the names of Shinto deities. From an aesthetic point of view, this is a fault in Gao's mind and makes these 30 poems on Tokyo inferior to some of Shinzan's other less brashly colloquial works. This is a fair criticism and an issue discussed frequently by Japanese kanji poets in their theoretical works. But we should not conclude from Shinzan's occasional inclusion of Japanese proper names in these works that they don't still fundamentally function as Chinese poems, as the observance of rhyme, grammar, and tonal features of Chinese all show. Moreover, we should, we should not assume that Shinzan's more formally conventional Sinitic poems, poems that would be judged superior from the point of view that Gao proposes, somehow put him in total thrall to Chinese aesthetics as far as content goes. So you can see in this quatrain, uh, Qinzan is celebrating an excursion to visit the cherry blossoms at Kaneiji. Uh, its final couplet reads, if the old man who does as he pleases had been born in our land, the crab apple flower he would not favor, he'd favor the wild cherry. By the old man who does as he pleases, Qinzan means the famous song poet Lu Yo, uh, whose fondness for the crab apple blossom was well known. He says here, uh, he, my love for these flame flowers drives me mad to the point of death. Uh, so, uh, as you can see here, uh, another mainland anthology of Japanese verse and literary Sinitic includes this poem by Qinzan. Again, the only explanation required is to identify to modern Chinese readers who Lu Yo was uh, and the fact that he was crazy about crab apple flowers. So by creating this Sinitic verse, Qinzan performed his membership in a hallowed regional tradition, one in which he engaged with the works of earlier writers, such as Lu Yo, significantly using precisely the same poetic form that pre his, such predecessors had employed. This shared tradition was the vital premise of the many written exchanges that took place between Sinospheric intellectuals throughout uh, the late 19th century. Consider the case of uh, Wang Tao, one of the uh, pioneers of Chinese journalism. In 1879, a Japanese newspaper invited Wang to spend several months in Japan, during which time he visited its major ports, toured the countryside, became a connoisseur of Tokyo nightlife, and attended a truly staggering number of parties. W Wang spoke no Japanese, but this in no way hindered him from having nearly daily Sinitic poetry exchanges with Japanese literary figures. Some of these written interactions were published simultaneously in Japanese newspapers, and they can also be traced through Wang's travelogue, uh, Fusang Yoji, published in both countries almost immediately after he completed the journey. Wang Tao is a major figure of modern Chinese letters, and his text is unambiguously a canonical work. Yet Wang's travelogue contains well over 100 Sinitic verses composed by Japanese that he encountered in the course of his travels abroad. In quoting these Sinitic verses by Japanese individuals and in writing his own poems in response, one makes no distinction between them and the poems written by Chinese diplomats and expatriates he encountered in Japan. On the same day that Wang praises the eminent poet and statesman Huang Zunqian, for example, uh, recording their exchanges in Sinitic verse, he records his exchanges with the eminent Japanese historian and traditional scholar Shigeno Yasutsugu. Or when strolling al along the uh, Sumida River one day, Wang Tao notices this poetic stele outside Chomeiji Temple's gates. The site was famous for the beautiful cherry blossoms that bloomed there, a springtime site commemorated in the stele uh, erected in 1870. Um, it contains verses by four of Japan's eminent Sinitic poets, including Onuma Chinzan. Recall that the poem uh, by Chinzan on the Sumida River that I uh, introduced earlier made use of the term Gull Ferry for the site. Well, Wang Tao describes the stele in his travelogue using the same term. He also takes the time to respond poetically to each of the four Sinitic verses by the Japanese poets inscribed on the stele, composing verses that match the rhymes of each and recording them in his travelogue. Wang Tao's reception of and response to the Sinitic verse by Chinzan, uh, so you can see here, uh, this is Chinzan's octet as inscribed on the stele, um, uh, rhyme characters indicated in red. Wang Tao's match uses the same characters. Um, this, re this particular response uh, was totally analogous to the response of a Japanese contemporary, Otsuki Banke, who also, uh, while walking along the Sumida, encountered Shinzan's octet and wrote his own couplet matching the rhyme characters here. So um, Banke and Wang Tao would have vocalized Shinzan's octet in mutually unintelligible ways. But their shared participation in a broader transregional textuality make, made it possible for them to leave behind comparable traces of their encounters with this written work. I've argued thus far for the importance of understanding kanji by Japanese poets uh, as written discourse, as poetic production that partook of a larger regional practice mediated by literary Sinitic. 
and as a form that remains intelligible, uh, remained intelligible and circulated in critical ways, irrespective of particular vocalized performances. I do not mean to imply, however, that kanshi were not also vocalized, for of course they were. Moreover, it is undeniable that these vocalizations were also one way in which kanshi were popularly disseminated in Japan. But even as we recognize the potential historical significance of such performances, the written text must not be equated with or reduced to any of these vocalizations. I'd like to uh, conclude by looking at a series of uh, early Meiji engagements with one Sinitic poem uh, by the late Edo Sinologue Dai Sanyo. Uh, <coughs> so this is Dai Sanyo's poems. It's one of his best known works, uh, composed in 1818 while he was traveling by boat off the western coast of Kyushu. Uh, is it a cloud, a mountain, u or yue? That hair's breadth of blue where sea meets sky. Um, so this poem, uh, is intertextually indebted to uh, both Japanese and Chinese precedents, um, but its tremendously exuberant spirit in which the poet imagines that he can see beyond the Japanese archipelago all the way to the mainland, off in the distance, uh, made it instantly famous. The Amakusa poem was alluded to by countless later kanshi poets, and it also circulated popularly through Sino-Japanese uh, recitation, that is, recitation in kundoku. Uh, one of the poems that Otsuki Bankei wrote when he visited uh, Kyoto in 1875 was this one, published in a Tokyo newspaper. It notes the popularity of the Amakusa poem as a piece that courtesans recite. <coughs> Similarly, um, this poem by Sakatani Roro is addressed to a hōkan, or a male jester, who is particularly adept at reciting Sanyo's Amakusa poem while plucking his shamisen. Even today, Dai Sanyo's poem on Amakusa is a favorite choice for practitioners of shigin. Uh, it's a kind of recitation. And of course, they uh, intone the poem in a distinctive, solemn mode. Uh, if you're curious, I would suggest you go to, go to uh, YouTube and check it out. There are many, many versions. All of these examples attest to how widely known the Amakusa poem is and how it has circulated popularly even among individuals who aren't necessarily readers or practitioners of kanshibu. There are a few Japanese kanshi that have been so widely disseminated uh, in the, the kundoku form. Uh, while there remain uh, a few variations among the various vocal renditions of Sanyo's Amakusa poem, what I'd like to call to, uh, attention to is the fact that the poem can never be reduced to these vocal renditions, ubiquitous though they are. So this is the cover of Tokei Shinshi, a collection published in June 1875 by two provincial men that Chinzan's, uh, like Chinzan's poems of Tokyo, aim to capture the sites of uh, Japan's newly renamed capital. The most unusual feature about this collection is that uh, 150 Sinaitic poems that it contains, they are all reworkings of a single poem, Dai Sanyo's poem on Amakusa. So if you look at the red characters there, they are uh, preserved in every single one of the poems in this anthology. So to give an example, government officials, uh, is it Satsuma or Choshu, Tosa or Hizan? Among three with cropped haircuts, one wears the top knot. The three-foot sword discarded when one wears military dress. The Japanese spirit perishes when one takes up Western study. Behold these, three, uh, these government officials of the four domains, each of them gets a thousand in gold awarded by the month. If you look at this one, same characters again preserved. On the fish market, fresh, delicious, raw, or grilled. With skipjack tuna, it is a hair-splitting race against time. When a fish uh, fetching a thousand in gold comes to market, the trout, sea bass, eel, and mackerel prices plummet. Behold the city dwellers who give free rein to their gluttony. They pawn their spring clothes with no regard for the due date. And last, the telegraph. Uh, on sea or on land, far or near, all the continents are truly separated by just a hair. Circling the whole globe without ship or carriage, coming and going messages are transmitted without any loss. Behold the electrical device, this new invention, it only lacks a cable to link us to the stars. So this is a collection of kanji that comes very close to crossing the border into kyoshi, uh, or sort of wild, crazy poems. Um, and clearly its interest for contemporary readers lay mainly in the fact that each of these 150-odd poems was recognizably a riff on the famous Sanyo Amakusa poem. The highlighted characters indicate these echoes of the earlier uh, kanshi, and this stands out most uh, obviously when you, when you look at several of these uh, in sequence on the page. You can see the preserved uh, characters um, in red there. These echoes are inaudible, however, and only endure in the written text. Even though Sanyo's Amakusa poem was extraordinarily well known and recited widely, the kuntan in these parodic reworkings of the poem explicitly invite us to perform the text in ways that obscure any connection to Sanyo's poem. 
So for example, uh, the second line of Sanyo's poem would conventionally be vocalized as suiten hofutsutoshite sei ipatsu. But uh, this line, the kunten tell us to read this kami wo akatsu ga gotoshi, which doesn't sound like sei ipatsu. Or ipatsu wo heratsu ga gotoshi, or kami no gotoshi, etc. The um, fourth line, uh, kemuri wa hosu ni yoko to watte hi yo yaku bosu, um, uh, up here, uh, if we look for uh, the bosu, here it's bosezu. Uh, uh, here it's bosu, so that's the same. Or bobotsu wo agu. So typically the echoes that make parodic renditions of a famous poem amusing are audible. Yet here, the fact that Tokei Shinshi nevertheless functions as a humorous coherent collection unified as reworkings of a single source text shows that even in a case po as popularly known as Sanyo's Amakusa poem, even in a collection that skirts as close to the border with Kyoshi as Tokei Shinshi, the text author's and reader's primary mode of engagement was with the text in its written form. The composition of Sinitic texts has consistently formed an essential part of Japanese literary expression from the inception of literacy in the 7th century through the modern period. Even as a full range of vernacular forms developed and thrived in Japan, Sinitic poetic and prose genres continued to flourish, stimulating and in turn being stimulated by Japanese language works. In approaching Japan's vast body of Sinitic literature, it is important for us to be mindful of its local specificity, considering the nature of Sinitic texts of both Chinese and Japanese provenance that were canonized in Japan uh, as exemplary models. The forms of uh, composition that became dominant, the methods by which Japanese producers of Sinitic texts attained their proficiency, and the various ways in which Sinitic texts were appreciated and recited. At the same time, however, we must balance such attentiveness to the particularities of Japan's Sinitic literary tradition with a recognition that the composition of Sinitic texts was an important means by which Japanese authors could insinuate themselves into a broader literary enterprise, one with a long history in Japan, but that also extended beyond its borders. Thank you. questions if there are questions or if I don't know if there's time. But. Hi. Uh, thanks for the really interesting talk and I um, uh, love the way that you have restored the writing of, uh, of what we don't want to call kanji. Uh, <laughs> to uh, its place in the literary history of Japan. I mean, this long um, history, but particularly its place at a time when uh, what you've called phonocentrism was, was, was sort of taking over and mm. eliminating kanji as a kind of a form that people could easily read. Um, my question has to do with something you just uh, briefly touched on right at the very end of your talk, mm. which is, uh, the fact that even though in some ways Kanchi was a s sort of cosmopolitan East Asian mm. um, genre, there were uh, <coughs> distinctions in Japan and in many places between mm -hmm. uh, poetry, uh, synetic poetry mm -hmm. and poetry of various kinds considered mm -hmm. to be written in Japanese, uh, which had a different name, mm -hmm. as you know, mm -hmm. Utan and, mm -hmm. and, and so on. Um, so could you just uh, explain a little bit about how that um, kind of, you know, surrounding literary discourse would mm -hmm. shape the way that people, what presented themselves as they were writing or mm -hmm. reciting kanji <coughs> uh, at the time? Um, I think that, uh, uh, thank you for the question. Um, the, the development of the term kanji uh, comes about in um, the 1880s, 1890s. Um, not as, uh, and, and it's no coincidence that it comes right then, um, because this is a time when um, sort of increasing national consciousness is, is going, and so there's a, there's a need for, uh, to distinguish uh, what had always been called she um, uh, from, uh, she was coming to be used as a general translation for the Western word poetry. Um, and so in, in order to make uh, that more uh, specific, it was necessary to add the word to it. Um, uh, 
And uh, so you, you see there a, a, a consciousness or a sort of insistence on um, identifying with a, with a, uh, um, a kind of a, a national uh, entity that hadn't been in the, t in the uh, uh, terms used previously. Up until that point, uh, maybe Uta would be the, um, you know, the point of distinction. Just two different uh, genres of, uh, of poetry there. Um, so people, I think, would not have necessarily regarded themselves as kanshijin or something like that, but uh, but shijin um, or maybe bunjin, which could Im could potentially embrace both. I don't know if that and gets to you know, uh, question. But yeah. mm. 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 Great. Uh, great. Uh, co coach, and uh, I'm from Japan, and mm. I used to work in China, so uh -huh. I really enjoyed your talking. And uh, if uh, we cons uh, if we perceive about the kanshi mm -hmm. in Japan, we usually compare with Japanese uh, uh, Japanese poetry, which mm -hmm. is like waka mm -hmm. or tanka. Mm -hmm. And uh, I personally feel like the kanshi is much more masculine mm -hmm. image, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, compared to the Japanese. Mm -hmm. Tanka or mm -hmm. Waka, mm -hmm. and do you think these kind of rules mm -hmm. is it affect effect to the those kind of masculine image to the kanji? Um, that's a uh, I think yeah. The, there are thank you for the question. There there are a, is a long history of associating um, writing in Chinese characters with um, you know the, the male hand as opposed to writing in uh, in kana as the, with the female hand. So this is this is a um, uh, there is that long history, um, but of course, as um, Tomiko Yoda and many others have uh, have indicated, this is a, a problematic uh, construction uh, from the beginning. Um, uh, the fact that it begins with a uh, male author cross-dressing as a female <laughs> is uh, w one indication of that, perhaps. Um, but uh, certainly, there's been a, a lot of interesting work uh, these days on um, uh, this is definitely a, a predominantly male um, uh, enterprise for most of uh, Japanese uh, literary history. However, uh, there were um, uh, several female poets who were uh, significant. Uh, in um, the most famous is Emma Saiko in uh, the Edo period, but she was certainly not alone. Uh, Yanagawa Kodan and uh, uh, s several others into the Meiji period. So. Um, uh, this is um, finding ways to uh, uh, take part in that um, uh, genre was um, uh, something of a challenge. Uh, people, if you look at the way that Emma Saiko's poems were uh, critiqued by her, her teacher, Rai Sanyo, um, he would say, um, uh, you should you should sound more feminine, or you should try to do 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 this, and you'll sound more feminine. Or so there was there was a kind of idea about uh, what that could be um, within even within the kanshi uh, world. But um, uh, nowadays, I, I I think that there are uh, you know lots of uh, uh, people among hobbyists who are interested, and in it. it's not not exclusively a male phenomenon either. So I, I was thinking as you were talking um, about this poetry in China, um, and it seems to me that there are some similarities to the situation as we move through time and we continue to make rhymes based on earlier pronunciations, mm -hmm. Middle Chinese pronunciations. So there are ways in which this applies in China too, where people may be reading poetry such that it doesn't rhyme. The change of word order, though, is mm -hmm. quite different. And so I wonder um, if that sort of plays into the way that you're conceptualizing mm -hmm. um, the specificity of the sinosphere mm -hmm. as opposed to other um, instances where you may have, as you said, a prestigious language mm -hmm. that's being then read in um, vernaculars, that there's something about um, the Chinese case that this is happening to a certain degree within China. Mm -hmm. um, and then that led me to um, think um, about uh, when this poetry, um, kanshi, is read aloud in Japanese in mm -hmm. these various versions, um, 
is that still considered she if it's not rhyming, if it's not in the, v in the vocalized version mm -hmm. um, following any of the many rules that the Japanese versions of these poems mm -hmm. um, seem to be following in the written mm -hmm. form? So you talked about prioritizing the written form, but then what is left that's poetic about these interpretive um, vocalizations in Japanese? That is an excellent question, um, uh, and one that's very difficult to answer. Um, f first, uh, the easy question um, on this. Um, uh, you mentioned uh, that there's a, a parallel between um, uh, the situation in, uh, in China, where rhymes change over time, and uh, later uh, uh, versions or later uh, uh, styles of pronunciation may not uh, capture uh, the earlier rhymes. And you can see that very clearly in um, this poem. Uh, so if you just read the, um, uh, the gloss, uh, the characters at the end, right, you have yue, and then you have fa, and then you have mo, and uh, then yue at the end. That doesn't sound like it rhymes at all in Chinese, right? But uh, this is because of the disappearance of rusheng, uh, the entering tone. Um, and so if you read these in, in Cantonese, probably it would still have this feature. But if you read it in just like onyomi, um, so you have etsu, hatsu, botsu, getsu. So those still rhyme in, in Japanese. Uh, and you can perceive that, but it, that's disappeared from Chinese, right? Um, uh, even though people would recognize, oh, that's all, it's all rusheng. So um, I think that um, one of the things that happens during the early modern period is that um, uh, there's a lot of theorization about uh, language and an appreciation for uh, sort of diachronic language changes. So um, in the same way that um, you know, Ming classicists are engaging with um, uh, Tang dynasty texts and, and earlier texts, um, that uh, gap that exists for Chinese readers, a lot of uh, Japanese sinological intellectuals see the same sort of uh, um, situation existing for themselves. So they, s they argue um, just uh, in the same way that uh, Ming people are, uh, are approaching these texts from a distance, so too are we uh, approaching these texts from uh, a chronological distance, but uh, you know, also a cultural difference. So th they, s they don't, um, uh, that argument is often used to say, uh, we shouldn't accept what, uh, whatever Ming intellectuals say, as, as valid because they're as distant as we are from, from these texts. Uh, so um, as for what remains um, uh, poetic about uh, these texts in recitation, I think you should ask th this guy what, uh, what he thinks. But um, no, I, uh, this is a difficult uh, question to, um, to answer because there is um, people who um, uh, recite uh, these poems in the Kundoku recitation. Uh, they uh, appreciate the rhythm of, uh, of kundoku. Certainly, Rai Sanyo um, is often cited as uh, a poet who was thoughtful about how will this be read in kundoku. And, um, and so that's definitely one part of, of the picture. But I would uh, argue that it, it manifestly is not the entire picture because we have these rhyme characters that Clearly, everyone, everyone knows you have to put in the rhyme characters. You have to follow ping and, and all of that, even if it disappears, completely disappears in how it's recited. Uh, so my, um, it's, it's sort of, and this is, this is why it's both, because <laughs> there's conscious, consciousness of uh, uh, kundoku is part of, part of what we need to look at, but uh, what we have on the page, we still need to look at what's on the page. I'm sure there are more questions, but it's after 12.45, so let's our guest with some applause. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you're interested in the workshop tomorrow, please come talk to me. Thank you.